everyone. We'll just give it a minute for everyone to get into the room. Hi everyone, we'll get moving into it, don't waste too much more time. Um, welcome to the machine learning splinter session. So here we're going to discuss everything machine learning related to tests. We've got six fantastic talks, all covering a very wide range of astrophysics from astro seismology, planets, flares, and more. Um, the format's going to be 15 minute talks, 12 minutes plus three for questions. And like the rest of the conference, please put all the questions through the Slack channel, which I'll then put through to the speakers. Um, feel free to post the questions during the talk so we can keep everything efficient. And with that, um, I'll move on to our first speaker today will be Emma Chickles. So thank you, Emma. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emma Chickles, um, and I'm an incoming PhD student at MIT. Uh, I've been working with Dr. Tonsu Dalen, also at MIT, and Lindsay Gordon, who just started at UMIN. Uh, our pipeline, named Morgan, uses unsupervised machine learning to conduct a census of different types of stellar variability using two-minute uh, cadence light curves observed by TESS. So, of course, although the primary goal of TESS is to look for exoplanets around nearby and bright stars, TESS has also observed lots of different types of stellar variability. Stellar variability has classically been divided into extrinsic sources, such as eclipses by companion, and intrinsic sources where the variability is being caused by changes in the physical properties of the stars themselves, such as by flares or pulsations. Um, some of these classes require spectroscopic data in order to classify a star, but we're focusing on the classes that are detectable just from their photometric light curves. The indiscriminate all-sky survey produced by TESS is a really exciting opportunity to better understand the typical properties of um, such as temperature, mass, and so on of many variability types, which is a step towards better understanding um, the sources of stellar variability. So our aim is to classify the variability types and light curves from the couple hundred thousand targets observed at a two minute cadence from the first two years of the test mission so that we can create a test catalog of stellar variability. Um, and we also want to find light curves that don't fit into our typical variability classes as in we want to find outlier light curves as well. Our pipeline is named Morgan and is made up of two parts. The first part is unsupervised feature generation from test light curves, and the second part is unsupervised clustering on the generated feature space. So in the first part of our pipeline, we use an algorithm called a convolutional autoencoder. The autoencoder is a convolutional neural network um, that aims to reduce the dimensionality of our light curves. Um, the encoder transforms the input, which are light curves, into low dimensional features in the bottleneck, and the decoder tries to reproduce the light curves from these bottleneck features. So in doing so, the autoencoder um, like learns the features that best represent the light curve. Then we use a clustering algorithm to find clusters within the feature space in an unsupervised way. So by using a CNN to extract features from the light curves, we can start performing clustering analysis on these learned features. So on this slide, we have a T-SNE or a T-distributed um, T distributed, uh, stochastic neighbor embedding of the feature space for sector one. This T-SNE visualizes the learned feature space in such a way that uh, similar feature vectors are close together in the three-dimensional three visualization. So note that there are around 16,000 points in the feature space where each point corresponds to a star observed in short cadence in sector one. So on the left, I've colored the um, TSNE based on cross-matching cross test targets with existing variability classifications, resulting in around 500 similar stars um, classified in either the general catalog of variable stars, Sinbad, or Assassin. And on the right, I've colored the data points based on the clustering results from the Gaussian mixture model clustering algorithm. So we can see that points that are close together in the feature space um, are, and thus light curves that are similar are put into the same cluster. 
Now, our goal is to automate the classification of stellar variability. So we want to assign each short cadence light curve in the first two years to a variability type or multiple variability types. So to do that, our current approach is um, if a cluster includes an object with a known variability classification, then we make the assumption that all the objects belonging to that cluster also share the same variability mechanism. So as a result of the 16,000 stars observed in short cadence in sector one, 500 of them had uh, cataloged variability classifications. And after our clustering analysis, we obtained 10,000 labeled stars. So from 500 to 10,000, which I hope gives you an idea of how our pipeline can augment existing variability catalogs. And here are some different views of the TSNI. To give an example of just one cluster, um, consider this uh, bright pink label on the left TSNI. Uh, the label EW and ROT stands for a low mass contact binary with rotational modulation. And notice that this point lies more or less in the middle of the feature space. And it's surrounded by a bunch of unclassified stars, which I've colored in black. But our clustering algorithm was able to find a cluster in that region of the feature space, which we can see as that cluster of bright pink in the right TSNI. So to summarize, these TSNI plots are how unsupervised machine learning views tests data, which I believe we can learn a lot from. So using our pipeline, we have uh, assigned a label to each short cadence light curve in the first two years. What we have on this slide is a taste of what our test catalog of stellar variability will include. Um, we ended up adopting the system of variability classification from GCBS, the General Catalog of Variable Stars, and we show six big groupings of variability types. We have four intrinsic variable groupings, including pulsating variables, which um, vary in brightness because of periodic expansion and contraction of their surface layers, eruptive variables, which vary in brightness because of flares and other violent processes, explosive and nova-like variables, and sources of strong variable X-ray radiation. And we also show two groupings of extrinsic variables, um, eclipsing binary systems and rotating variable stars, um, which vary in brightness because of non-uniform surface brightness like sunspots. Um, note that the the classifications represented in the summary plot are based on running the autoencoder on each sector separately. The reason why we couldn't train the autoencoder on all the sectors at once was because our machine learning model requires a homogeneous input matrix. And the time gaps from the data downlinks are at different times each sector. So we are also interested in performing clustering analysis across all uh, 200,000 light curves instead of within each sector. And I'll touch a little bit about how we are doing this at the end, um, if I have time. <laughs> for some validation, let's look at some distributions for the values of mass, effective temperature, magnitude, and um, the range of variability of our predicted and previously cataloged low mass contact binaries. Um, a W or say Majoris variable or a low mass contact binary is made up of uh, two stars that share a con common envelope of material. The stars are in thermal contact, so heat flows from the more massive star to the less massive one. Um, but the important thing is that their light curves are easily recognizable from their near equal minima and continuous light variations, which are caused by the two bodies um, uh, occulting each other during the co course of a revolution. Um, because of their distinct light curve shape, this variability type makes a great example for our pipeline, which performs the clustering analysis um, from their light curves, from features extracted by their light curves. So as we expect, in each case, the distributions of the predicted and the cataloged low mass contact binaries are reasonably similar. But as you can see in the y-axis for our predicted contact binaries, have many more samples. In other words, these plots show a, um, a success successful extrapolation of the GCVS catalog to the full sky as observed by tests. In addition to classifying stellar variability, one of our other goals is to do an anomaly detection on all test light curves. Since our CNN has extracted these features from the light curves, it makes it easy for us to compare all these stars and decide which are inliers and which are outliers. 
when we ran our CNN on just around 16,000 light curves, again, from sector one, um, uh, the most typical light curves were these really low signal to noise light curves with little variability. And some of the most unusual stars that we found in the sector was a, a rare flaring star and a cataclysmic variable, which is a system of two stars, including a white dwarf that accretes matter from another nearby star, resulting in these huge spikes in brightness. And lastly, briefly, I want to give an overview of some of our more recent work. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the drawbacks of the convolutional autoencoder is that it's very difficult to train the same model on light curves from different sectors since we need a homogeneous input matrix. One alternative that would allow us to perform clustering and anomaly detection on light curves from many different sectors is by using an engineered feature space. In particular, we compute features from the phase curves of periodic light curves. We did this first by determining whether or not the light curves LS periodogram contains just one dominant frequency as opposed to multiple dominant frequencies. Then we fold the light curve based on the dominant frequency to produce a phase curve. And then finally, we bin the phase curve to produce a feature vector on which we can do clustering and outlier analysis, just as we did for the autoencoder dragged feature space. So in addition to engineering features based on phase curves, we're also considering incorporating information that is not contained in the light curve data, such as spectroscopic data, for example. And ideally, we hope to optimally combine these features with our engineered features and our autoencoder derived features to perform more accurate clustering. Um, and lastly, I want to say that we have a paper in prep, which we hope to publish by the end of 2021 in addition to making our catalog of stellar variability um, publicly available. So, thank you, and I look forward to any questions. <laughs> Great, thanks for the nice talk, Emma. Um, there's a, at least one question coming through the Slack. So Daniel Giles said, um, did you say how non-variables were filtered out prior to classification, um, or are most objects found to be in a variability class? Um, wait, sorry, could you repeat that? Oh. Um, did you say how non-variables are filtered out before the classification? Um, um, what happens to the non-variant ones, I think? Oh, so uh, we don't discriminate between like the non-variable stars and variable stars. Um, what happens is uh, let's see. if there is a classification for it, whether it be a variable, um, a variability classification or um, uh, the same applies to if we were um, classifying transients or other object types, the same thing would happen. Um, we will cluster it in the same way. If a cluster that we find includes something with a classification, then that whole cluster will um, be applied to that same label. I hope that makes sense, but I can uh, talk more about this offline as well. <laughs> sure, and that will be in the Slack to look at. And there's another question from Mark Hon saying, how sensitive is the method to outliers, such as sort of when there are several timestamps with large flux values from cosmic rays, sort of one-off outliers like that? Are those mm. kind of things picked up? So um, for cosmic rays, those are on like very short time scales. And right now our autoencoder does struggle with um, identifying like really short time scale features. It has trouble reconstructing um, uh, features like that. But we're hoping with a hierarchical um, clustering algorithm, so something that can not only find global outliers, but also um, outliers relative to each cluster, then maybe we'll be able to find objects like that too. Great. Um, okay, I think we should move on to the next talk to stay on schedule. So thanks again, Emma. Thank you. Um, and the next speaker will be Zoe de Beers. Um. Yes, let me share my screen real quick. Are you able to see my screen? All right, so yes, hello. Uh, my name is Zoe DeBurz, and I'll be starting a PhD at MIT this coming fall. Uh, and in my talk today, I'll be talking about my research in using a machine learning inspired method to reveal the mass of K2167b. Um, this is just one example of using these types of methods to discover the mass of a planet. Um, and in the future, we plan to apply this method more widely to eventually pave the way towards detecting the masses of Earth twins that are orbiting bright nearby stars. 
Um, but before I kind of go into why we specifically focus on this target K2-167 and what kind of machine learning approach we exactly took, I'm going to go into a little bit of the background of radio velocities and what kind of problems inspired this work and how it relates to tests. Um, so I know many of us here are obviously well aware of how awesome transits are and how many interesting questions we can answer using transit transits. Um, but I wanted to kind of give you an overview of why you should also care about radio velocities and how radio velocities can help us answer a wide variety of interesting questions um, related to planet detection and characterization. So in the radio velocity method, we're obviously measuring the gravitational pull of planets on our host stars and how this causes the host stars to wobble such that we can measure the masses of the planets that we're interested in. Specifically, when we measure the masses of planets with a known radii from transit observations, for example, this can help us also determine the density and possible compositions um, of the system that we're looking at. For example, are we dealing with a rocky, potentially Earth-like planet or instead a puffy, low-density Neptune-like planet? Um, radial velocities can also help us detect planets that may not actually transit, um, for example, planets with really high inclinations. So these are just a few questions that are really interesting where we can use radial velocities um, or transit observations might not be able to answer these exact questions. Uh, you may also ask, how does this relate to tests? Um, and this is because RVs can help fulfill the test level one science requirements, which is to measure the masses of 50 test planets with radii smaller than for four Earth radius. Um, so this is kind of how it relates to the test mission. However, there is a problem. And that problem is stellar activity. So stellar activity in the form of these dark regions on the surface of a star, which have highly magnetized areas, um, can make it really difficult to actually find these planetary radio velocity signals. Specifically, stellar activity, activity can hide or mimic planetary signals. Um, and this has led to that stellar activity has created a plateau in our sensitivity to lower mass planets. Um, so obviously, as you can see in this plot, um, if we look at the masses of planets that we've discovered as a function of discovery year, we've seen leaps in sensitivity to smaller and smaller planets as our methods of detection have improved. However, from 2010 onwards, there really hasn't been a notable increase in precision to smaller planets. And a major goal of the exoplanet field is to find Earth-like planets. So pushing past this plateau is a huge priority for the field. Um, before I get into why we exactly see this plateau, I'm gonna give a little bit more of a quick refresher on how we exactly measure the masses using the radial velocity method. Um, so as I mentioned, the radial velocity method exploits this gravitational pull that the planet exerts on the host star, um, but specifically these planets introduce translational shifts to the average line spectrum as the star is moving towards us or away from us. And we can measure this average line profile by calculating a cross correlation function or a CCF between the spectrum and a template of delta functions. Uh, when we're using high precision spectrographs like the Harps North spectrograph, these shifts can then be measured and used to infer details of a planet's mass and its orbit. However, like I said, um, we have this problem of stellar activity. Specifically, stellar activity can result in line shape changes of these cross correlation functions. Um, in the case of some sunspots, we can see here that as it rotates into view, this star spot, it was changing the line shape of the CCF. And when these shape changes are introduced, they can mimic or hide the translational shifts that we look for when we're looking for planets. Um, specifically, stellar activity in the form of these star spots um, can cause radio velocity signals on the order of five meters per second, whereas Earth twins orbiting sun-like stars will produce signals on the order of 10 centimeters per second. And so characterizing and effectively removing this stellar activity is necessary for us to actually become sensitive to measuring the masses of smaller and smaller planets. Um, so our solution to this problem um, is to use machine learning methods to predict and remove that stellar activity noise so that we can reveal the signals of those smaller and smaller planets. Um, specifically, we train these methods to learn to predict stellar activity radial velocity changes based on those shape changes that you saw earlier in the CCFs I discussed. So in this plot here, which is from our recent paper that's under review at the Astronomical Journal, we're looking at a bunch of these CCFs that are color-coded based on how red-shifted or blue-shifted 
the radial velocity signals are. And this is then being input into a neural network. And then finally, the neural network will predict what the cellular activity signal is. Um, and so this was specifically for a data set um, of the sun for the Harps North Solar Telescope. And this work really inspired our work um, on K2167 um, because we wanted to see whether now that we could do this well for the sun, whether we could also apply it to other systems. Um, so here on the right, you can kind of see the pipeline again, where we have these high precision spectra that are then cross correlated that's fed into our neural network models. And then finally, that allows us to disentangle the stellar activity signals from an injected planet, for example, or a real planet if we're looking at another star than the sun. Um, so you might wonder how well did this do for your solar observations? Um, so it did relatively well. It reduced the stellar activity noise by a factor or by about 25 to 50 percent. Uh, when we did this, we implemented three different kinds of neural network models, a linear, a fully connected, and a convolutional neural network, uh, where the convolutional neural network performed the best. Um, and you can see here again what the inputs to the neural network were, and then the model predicted outputs, you know, these uh, cellular activity signals, as well as what the true uh, signals should be from the HARPS North pipeline. And so you can see that it pretty closely follows that one-to-one -one ratio, which we were hoping to see. Um, okay, so this was for solar observations again, and this really inspired our work on K2-167. So we wanted to see, okay, now that we've done this for solar observations, can we do this for an exoplanet system? Can we um, apply this kind of a method to an extrasolar star? Um, so K2-167 was detected by both K2, Tess, and Spitzer. Um, the radio velocities were also measured by Harps North in 2016. Um, but they were quite noisy with stellar activity, such that even state-of-the-art methods that are used for stellar activity mitigation, such as Gaussian process regressions, could not yield a significant mass detection. So it was not possible to measure the mass yet. Um, so ultimately, we wanted to see, could we modify our method to apply it to the star, and would it actually help measure the mass? Um, so here you can again see uh, some of the data from K2 and test for this planet, as well as the best fitted transit models. Um, and then for the Harps North observations, this is what those CCFs look like. Um, so again, you can kind of see that there's a pattern that emerges based on how red shifted or blue shifted the signals are. And we can see that there's different shape changes that correspond to that. And that's exactly what we want the machine learning type of algorithm to learn. Um, in this case, for this extrasolar star, we had to make some modifications. Um, we're not using a neural network. Instead, we're using a linear regression model. And that's for a couple of different reasons, um, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, but overall, you can kind of see the pipeline is quite similar. Um, so I mentioned that we had to change our machine learning approach. We're using a linear regression instead, something much simpler. Um, and this is for a couple of different reasons. But the two primary reasons is that one, radial velocity data sets for extrasolar stars rarely have as many observations as the solar data set from Harps North, which had about 600 days of observations. Whereas in the case of K2167, we had about 76 observations. Um, the second reason is that we lack a firm ground truth for stellar activity signals of extrasolar stars, since some planets may still be hidden. Whereas for the sun, we can easily remove the RV contributions of the known planets in the solar system. So to overcome these two issues, we made a couple of different modifications. First, we significantly simplified the machine learning model. Instead of using complex and flexible models like neural networks, we use a linear regression approach with a simplified input representation where we're sampling across the CCF at 10 locations. Um, and essentially this is just sacrificing some fidelity in our stellar activity corrections in exchange for being able to immediately apply this method to a larger, a much larger sample of stars. Um, the second modification that we made to our technique is that we are simultaneously fitting uh, the planet signal together with the stellar activity model, since we cannot a priori remove all the planet signals from the data set, since some of those signals might still be hidden, we might not know whether they're there. Um, and so what you can see in this equation on the bottom is kind of that model summarized where uh, CCF here, all these CCF terms stand for our stellar activity model, and then all of the orange terms uh, stand for our Keplerians that we are simultaneously fitting to see uh, how much each is contributing to the overall radial velocity signal. 
So you might wonder, okay, how well does this actually do for your target, K2-167? Um, and so we find that our simplified machine learning model significantly reduces the radial velocity scatter by a factor of about two. Um, and it increases the precision, precision with which we recover the mass of the transiting planet from 2.3 sigma to about four sigma. Um, and so you can see in this figure, this is prior to applying any kind of activity correction on the left and on the right is after applying the activity correction and removing those stellar contributions to the radial velocity. Um, we also find that our MCMC fit uh, finds that the mass is about six times as massive as the Earth and that the orbital phase and period agree with the known 9.98 day period from transits. Um, so we find that this has a mass that is quite a bit bigger um, and it in its mass and composition does not agree uh, with the Earth-like composition. Um, but nonetheless, this result demonstrates that our method can reveal the mass of a planet whose mass was previously hidden by stellar activity. Um, and in the future, we can hope to widely apply this method to other stars and potentially find planets that are more Earth-like in composition. Um, so overall, this is very promising, and we are working on a paper on this now. Um, and, and with that, I have my... Yes, thank you. Perfect. And with that, I'll just conclude. Um, and with our conclusions that machine learning methods can reduce stellar activity noise by a factor of about two for the sun, um, and that we also were able to successfully apply a simplified machine learning method to reveal the mass of K2167b. Um, and in the future, we want to apply this to a widely, a larger sample of solar type stars to help fulfill the level one test science requirement. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks for a great talk. So there's questions piling in on the Slack. So <laughs> lots of interest. Okay. Um, Rodrigo Diaz says, very nice work. I imagine the Keplerian terms in your linear regression model are sinusoidal terms, right? Or do you somehow manage to include eccentricity? Um, we did, um, we, I think, yeah. So this one is sinusoidal, but we are working on actually also making them fully Keplerian and including eccentricity. So that's kind of like something that we're working on now. Yeah. yeah. Um, Adina Feinstein says, great talk. Uh, do you know how well your method works for RVs from other instruments other than Harps North and or how well would it do by combining RV measurements from different instruments? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have done some work um, with express data, um, looking at whether we can also apply it to some of those observations. Um, and I think for some of the stars that we are working with, we do see a significant improvement in terms of the RV scatter. And for some of them, not so much. So we're kind of working on to see whether that has something to do with the instrument or whether it just might be something about that star intrinsically. Um, but we're part of kind of this uh, collaboration that's looking at a whole bunch of these methods for the same data set. Um, so we are looking at other instruments in terms of combining RV data sets. Um, we haven't done any work looking at if we combine them, but that might be an interesting future direction as well. Yeah, great question. Um, there's a follow-up from Rodrigo saying, did you check over for overfitting in the K2167 data set? I don't know if that's... Yes. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that there's a couple of things in, in regards of overfitting. So I think one of the things that we try to be really careful about is making sure that we're not giving the model too much flexibility in terms of... So one thing is, you know, you might intrinsically say like, oh, why don't you feed in this entire cross correlation function? Because you might be able to get more information from the shape changes that the star activity introduces. But if you did that, you would definitely overfit because you have about 160 elements in this array and only 76 data points. So you'd have way too many free parameters, um, which is why we kind of intentionally only choose 10 of them that are kind of spread across it to make sure that we prevent that kind of overfitting. Um, so one thing that we um, were kind of looking at as well is just making sure that we spread these kind of evenly rather than giving the model infinite flexibility in terms of choosing these. Um, so yeah, we do have some things in place to make sure that it doesn't overfit. Great, um, I think we should move on. There's more, plenty more questions on the Slack. So please do look at that <laughs> when you get the yes, chance. I, I will, thank <laughs> But you I have so to much. move it on for the schedule. So thanks again. Um, thank you. The next speaker will be Max Ginter. So Max, do you want to head off? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, you can see and hear my slides uh, and myself, I hope. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the previous speakers. And thanks a lot, Dave, and everybody else for giving me the opportunity to present my research today and that of, of many collaborators. 
My name is uh, Max Günther. I'm a Taurus postdoctoral fellow at MIT, and currently I'm actually in transition to a new role at the European Space Agency, um, where I'll start as an ESA research fellow in the Netherlands in just a few weeks. In the next uh, couple of minutes, I will walk you through how we leverage machine learning with test data, with the goal of connecting exoplanet and stellar flare research in the context of habitability. And just to set the stage for everybody in the audience, maybe people newly joining the test family these days, why should we care about this? Well, for one, even our nearest neighbor star, Proxima Centauri, has an Earth-sized exoplanet. And that one has a temperature that might just be right for life. However, Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, only about 15% the size of the sun and only about half the temperature. Now, red dwarfs have become such a prime target for tests and other missions because they make up about 70% of all stars. And on average, they can host at least one Earth-sized exoplanet, often multiple. Additionally, red dwarf small sizes and low temperature make it a lot easier for us to detect and study exoplanets and their atmospheres. And since we're biased to detect planets in short orbits around them, these cool stars actually allow them to fall into a temperate zone where liquid water is possible. Note that I'm not saying habitable zone, and this is because there are many, many other major factors that we have to consider. And the one I'm focusing on in my research and the one I'm focusing on in my talk today are stellar flares. These immense brightening events release radiation from X-ray to the optical. And they're often accompanied by coronal mass ejections, which are charged particle streams. Together, those two can release energies of up to 10 to the 38 Earth, which equals about millions of nuclear bombs all at once. So it's pretty clear that these violent stellar outbursts can drastically shape the planets around them, especially if those planets are on weekly orbits like four red dwarfs in the liquid water zone. But stellar flares and coronal mass ejections can interfere with the atmospheric chemistry or even completely strip off the atmospheres. That's why it's tricky to speak of a habitable zone there. On the other hand, flares might actually be what initiates life in the first place around M dwarf or red dwarf um, stars, because they could actually trigger UV prebiotic chemistry where the red dwarfs themselves don't have enough UV light to do that. So in laboratory experiments, by shining actual UV lamps onto a primordial soup of simple molecules, my collaborators at Cambridge, Harvard, and other places can actually trigger these processes, leading to precursors of RNA, the very first steps towards these building blocks. That means there's this fine sweet spot between flares being a danger, but also flares potentially being necessary to trigger life. What fascinates me as a researcher is understanding where this fine sweet spot lies. And that's where TESS comes in, especially our new TESS year one and two study that's in prep. With TESS over the last couple of years, we surveyed the entire sky, almost the entire sky, and we gathered two minute cadence data on over 220,000 stars in that process. So if we zoom into this large composite image that shows all the TESS uh, pictures that were taken, and we pick a certain star down here, and we can see how its light is spread out onto test image pixels. However, the yellow blob you see down there, that's not the star I'm focusing on today. That's just a bright neighboring star. The star I'm talking about is actually marked in these like light white pixel outlines, and it's barely visible right now to our eye, but it's there, you have to trust me. Let's look at the same image pixels just one hour later after this observation we suddenly have an immense brightening event of this star. And continuing to take pictures, let's see how this looks after a few more hours, maybe five hours. It's all gone again. So the star is back to its quiescent brightness, barely visible on our detectors. And this is how the light curve of this object looks like. And you see that this particular red dwarf got brighter by a factor of 16. That's an immense brightening event. I think the uh, biggest brightening events I read about in the literature were for about I think it was Proxima Centauri, about uh, 64 times it was uh, recovered with every scope. Um, so this is outstanding. And we can't even imagine anything like this for our sun. Imagine the sun suddenly getting brighter by a factor of 16 or even 64. That's just crazy. Now, if we look at these light curves, if we look at the image pixels, human eyes are exceptionally good at picking these things out. However, with the big data era of tests, human inspection of all these stars would literally take a lifetime. 
So we employed Bayesian frameworks and neural networks to do it much more efficiently and robustly. And in particular today in this talk, I want to highlight the Stellar software that was developed by Alina Feinstein, who is later joining us in the panel discussion to answer any questions about Stellar and uh, contribute to the discussion about neural networks and machine learning. And this Stellar software is a convolutional neural network or CNN. And just like shown in this cartoon here, where we use a CNN to differ between dogs and cats, we did the same and we trade train Stella to differ between flare and not flare cases by looking at short sections of the light curves. Now, back in our first test sector one and two study published in 2020, we found flares using a Bayesian combination of detrending, outlier detection, and nested sampling model fitting, and countless hours of me eyeballing to make sure we caught as many real flares as we can, but also minimize the risk of any false positives. And with this, we created a first flare catalog for the test mission. We then used this catalog in 2020 as a training sample for Adina's Stella neural network, with the result that you can see in this figure here. So Stella, running on arbitrary test light curves, is nicely able to differ between these non-flare cases and flare cases, even in the presence of systematics, like the long-term systematics you see in the top right, um, but also pick out flares, even if they fall into variable stars, where especially young M dwarfs are always very variable. We have uh, lots of spots and uh, often fast rotating stars. So flares can be quite hidden in all these ups and downs of the light curve. But you see here that uh, Stella picks out that flare quite nicely because of its localized view, uh, focused on about 200 cadences, which in test has a two minute cadence in the short term uh, light curves that we have here. So Stella is really nicely able to differ between all these cases. Now, going further, in this example here, we use Stella uh, on a test light curve of very fast variable stars, so young M dwarf actually in this case. And this, despite all the intrinsic variability of red dwarfs, we can still pick out the flares robustly. And that's what you see here, and we can even assign probabilities of how much we trust them. So the yellow parts here is where Stella says like, no, these chunks of light curves I don't think these have flares, probability of a flare being zero. On uh, the dark blue parts, you see, oh, Stella has, is very sure that this part here is a flare. And zoomed in onto a shorter region because there's a very fast modulation here. Uh, that's the little subplot you see with the gray background on the right. Um, you see that it actually picks out these flares quite nicely. Now, we can very simply run this on all the test data. As soon as the model is trained, it's very fast to evaluate on all these 220,000 light curves. And the Kepler mission, going a step back, back in 2016, published by Jim Davenport here, um, had allowed us a first very big ensemble study of stellar flares. And this diagram is actually showing us the effective temperature ranges on the x-axis versus the test band magnitude on the y-axis of all the flaring stars that Kepler had uh, classified and cataloged. So these are the light gray points. Now, in our first test study of sectors one and two only, so the first two months of the mission only, we could already explore a completely new parameter space, a large ensemble of flaring red dwarfs that weren't there in Kepler before because Kepler had a very different service strategy and stared at one part of the sky, mainly focusing on sun-like stars. Now, if we go the step further and we add all the data that we get from test year one and two retrieved by Stella, we see how we can drastically expand this. And this is if we only trust the really high probability flares. So this is what Stella says has a probability of higher than 90%. Now, if we go further and we say, well, let's take the marginal cases as well, because we get those, we can catalog those. So we can actually provide a kind of a high, um, high yield catalog and a very high accuracy catalog. Now, if we include lower probability signals, we say, well, we trust everything that's where Stella is more than 50% sure that this is a flare. Then you see how massively this gets populated. And there's quite some interesting effects in there, which are um, also very driven by Tessa's input catalog for the short cadence. So another interesting and, and natural next step will be to expand this and run this on the full frame image. Uh, data, especially now that we have 10-minute full-frame images in uh, year three. 
and will get increased cadence even more in the continuing mission, as George Rigger pointed out on Monday. So you see already this massive ensemble that we can get from machine learning methods and tests. Machine learning really works with a few caveats, of course, and I'm sure we'll come to a bunch of these in the panel discussion later. But now moving on, what do we learn from this about the physics of flares? Like, why do we even employ this machine learning algorithm to this data? Why do we care about creating such a big catalog? And that's where the flare frequency diagram enters, which is a cumulative distribution histogram. The x-axis shows you a given threshold energy, and the y-axis shows you how many flares with that energy we observe on a given day. For example, looking at our light curve on the left, uh, let's say we have one big flare, uh, the one around uh, day 1660, which has an energy of 10 to the 35.5 erg. And that happens once every couple of weeks. So we can just uh, put this on our diagram. Uh, we can also look um, two minutes. Yeah. Uh, at the other flares, where we have energies of at least 10 to the 33 erg once every couple of days. So we can create this cumulative distribution diagram. Now, if we compare this to our sun, this simple M dwarf, where we observe dozens of those, uh, dozens, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of those in tests, um, is much, much more violent than our sun. The sun also flares, but on a drastically different scale. Overplotting it here shows just how many more magnitudes uh, quiet it is. And even the largest solar flare ever recorded, the Carrington event from 1859, only reached an energy of 10 to the 33.5 erg. And back then, this event caused magnificent aurora around the globe, but it also wrecked havoc and led to the destruction of telegraph lines. And if this would happen nowadays, we would be quite doomed, uh, honestly, because uh, aviation, uh, any kind of electricity, internet, etc., depends on, uh, on this. So luckily, it's quite a rare event. And luckily for us, for like an advanced civilization, um, that depends on electricity, et cetera. This doesn't happen very often, not very violently, violently. but comparing it again to M dwarfs, this happens almost every day. Now, what about other red dwarfs? We see they all behave about the same scale, but they have slightly different slopes. So what we can do to relate this to habitability in, in our studies is to basically assume it's a log log plot. We feel a line, that's what physicists do. And then we can extrapolate into regimes that we can't observe with tests, because for most stars, we only have 28 days. For some, we luckily have already a year, but with the extended mission, we get more and more data. Now that we can extrapolate into these wild regimes, we can actually compare this to two criteria that we do here, ozone sterilization and prebiotic chemistry. The red area highlights where flares and coronal mass ejections dissociate the ozone and planetary atmosphere. And as ozone is the primary absorbent for harmful radiation, the next stellar outburst could penetrate through and sterilize all surface biology. And we know this red area thanks to atmospheric models and computer simulations. The green area, on the other hand, that highlights that life needs an energy source to originate. So that goes back to the laboratory study I pointed out earlier. This could be lightning strikes, this could be hydrothermal events, but my collaborators like Paul Rimmer and others have found that it most likely comes from stellar UV light. Um, Red dwarfs alone don't have enough UV light to trigger this, but their flares do. So apologies also for the red and green color scheme. This will be amended for the paper. With this, I come to my conclusion slide, and I just leave this open for you. And while I focused here more on the science results in this talk, I want to highlight again Adina's development on, of the stellar neural network, which made all this possible. And please come to speak to Adina and myself in Slack later in the panel discussion or anytime afterwards. Get in touch if you want to discuss more and accompanying papers, papers on the horizon. Probably once I've settled down at the European Space Agency, it'll finally be out. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to present our research today. Thanks, Max. Um, we have time for one question, <laughs> I think. Um, I see someone typing on the Slack. Don't know if they're going to type particularly quickly. But if not, I have one myself. So do you, do you see any sector dependence in your recovery of the flares? Um, is it easier to spot them in different sectors than others, for example? Yeah, there's a few things I want to get into in, in the panel discussion, possibly. Um, yes, it, it, it depends on like the test systematics um, a little bit. I haven't looked into like it 
in complete detail yet. There's a few sectors where Earth scattered light, for example, like sector 25, 26, um, has had a massive impact. That will be really interesting to compare a few things. Um, generally, it, Stella does a really good job actually at uh, discerning between any kind of instrument systematics and flares because they are usually on very different time scales. Um, the problems we found recently is uh, very fast variable stars, um, where basically looking only at a, a short region of 200 cadences, and you have like a little spike of like a sinusoidal modulation of a, a star that rotates on like an hourly time scale. That looks exactly like a flare on this like short view. So that's something we, we uh, are working on on refining for the future. But now we also that also depends a lot on the training example because our original Tessier one, uh, sector one and two catalog didn't have that many of these examples that we find now in where we like scan through the entire sky. We have more clusters, more young associations where we have younger stars that fast rotators. Thanks very much. Um, I guess we should move to the next speaker, which is Andreas Hagiotio. So, Andreas, are you online? Yes, hi. Let me share my screen. Brilliant. Can you see my screen? Yep, that's all fine. Great. So, hi, everyone. My name is Andreas Hagiotio, and I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Warwick. Today, I will be presenting Raven an automated vetting and validation pipeline, which I'm currently developing alongside my supervisor, Dr. David Armstrong. Now, the motivation for the development of this pipeline is essentially twofold. First of all, simulations suggest that tests can potentially detect up to 14,000 planets from its primary mission data alone. The extended missions will further increase this number. And as can be seen from uh, this plot from Barclay et al, the, major, the vast majority of those planets will be drawing the full frame images where the false positive rate has been estimated to be 11 per one true planet. Therefore, it stands to reason that the potentially tens of thousands of planet candidates will be accompanied by hundreds of thousands of false positives. The enormity of these numbers suggests the need for an automated pipeline able to identify and separate false positives from planetary candidates accurately, quickly, and on a large scale. Moreover, planetary candidates will still need to be confirmed, ideally through independent follow-up observations. However, not all candidates will be accessible to such follow-up observations, especially those around faint stars. And of course, the large, the large number of candidates will lead to prioritization of those most suitable. This will leave many candidates with a strong indication to be two planets from the transit signal, essentially unconfirmed. Statistical validation could therefore allow for those candidates to be classified as true planets just from their transit signal alone. And before presenting our pipeline, I would, like to, I would like to first introduce the concept of vetting and validation. Vetting refers to the process of separating false positives from true planet candidates and can be done either manually through eyeballing or automatically through the use of a pipeline. Many vetting pipelines have been uh, successfully developed, especially for Kepler, with some of those using machine learning implementations. Validation on the other hand, refers to the statistical confirmation of an exoplanet by calculating the likelihood probability of a candidate being a false positive or a true planet. Only a handful of validation implementations currently exist. These include Blender, Pastis, and Vespa, which were developed for Kevlar, and Triceratops, the only pipeline developed exclusively for TESS. It should be noted that validation accounts for about 30% of all confirmed exoplanets to date, with the majority of those um, validated using Vespa. Now, our pipeline, it introduces an automated vetting and validation in a single workflow specifically developed for tests. It uses four different machine learning classifiers for its vetting to separate planetary candidates from astrophysical and non-astrophysical false positives. It also introduces a new statistical validation implementation, which combines the machine learning classification score with pre-computed prior probabilities to determine the likelihood probability of the candidate being a true planet. Candidates with probabilities higher than 99% will be statistically validated using our pipeline. This project builds upon previous work on developing such a pipeline for Kepler data by, by Armstrong et al. in 2020, which was found to be quite effective and essentially serves as proof of concept for our work. I would like to, um, to um, essentially uh, show you an overview of uh, the process that we're using, starting with 
the data ingestion. Now, the pipeline takes as input a list of candidate events with their properties, such as the epoch, the period, the transit duration, and an estimation of the transit depth, along with a path to the LATCAR file. The LATCARs are then read, detrended, and prepared for further processing. We are currently using LATCARs extracted from the full frame images using a pipeline developed by the NGTS team, which we're very thankful for, and the candidate events are identified through that pipeline or with their integrated BLS survey. You can see an example of uh, those extracted light curves on the floor below. The second step is the identification of nearby sources and the calculation of dilution factors and central offsets. This step is quite important for TESS because it's relatively large pixels lead to significant blending of light from nearby stars. We are therefore uh, identifying nearby sources in a 220 arc second radius using the test input catalog and Gaia. For the nearby sources, the flux contribution is then determined based on their pixel distance from the target, their test magnitude, and a corresponding point spread fraction. This allows us to essentially undilute the light curve and only consider the flux from the target itself. In addition, we're calculating the centered offset, the pixel shift of the center of the incoming light, which occurs during the transits of each candidate. The sensory offset serves as a major indication of whether the event we're looking at is originating on the target or on a nearby or a background star. The third step is the identification of the possible sources for each candidate event. And for this step, the nearby sources are examined based on three criteria. First of all, we're looking at the calculated flux contribution and remove any of non-contributing sources. Then we're looking at whether the source is bright enough to cause the observed eclipse, removing any that are fainter than what we're looking for. Finally, we are looking at the centered shift expected if the source is the source of the eclipse, and we remove any that are not consistent with our observations. These identified possible sources are then treated as separate candidates, and the pipeline computes their likelihood probability. This allows us to do two things. First, to determine the nearby false positive probability, and secondly, to potentially identify the actual source of the eclipse. Then for the, first, for the fourth step, we have the prior probability calculation. Prior probabilities are calculating for the following scenarios, which include various transiting planets and eclipsing binary configurations. The prior probabilities incorporate the position probability, which is the probability that the signal is originating on the target, a secondary source, or a background source and we're deriving these from our centered offset calculations. It also includes the occurrence rate for planets and eclipsing binaries and the probability to detect the eclipse with tests. For our non-statistical false positives, we give them the same parallel probability as that of a planet. This is actually uh, a flaw of our pipeline at the moment that we're looking to improve in the future. Then we move on to the machine learning vetting. As mentioned before, we're using four different mach machine learning classifiers, which include a Gaussian process and a random forest. These classifiers are trained on a synthetic training set, which is constructed from detailed simulated transits for the planet and the astrophysical false positive scenarios mentioned before, generated with the FASTIS software. These simulations are specifically tailored to test data by choosing targets from the test input catalog to simulate on, and then injecting the simulations in the corresponding test light curves. You can check the quality of our simulations by looking at the simulated planetary transit and the simulated background eclipsing binary event, which were injected in test light curves on the plus and right. For the non astrophysical false positives, we are constructing a training set with pre identified test light curves which contain such a signal. The machine learning models, of course, require a set of metrics to be trained on, and these metrics are derived from the light curves. The metrics incorporate stellar and planetary characteristics and feature specific to the observed transits. For an extensive list of the metrics we're using and a short description, I refer you to the Kepler pipeline paper, which is where it's essentially replicating the metrics that they were used for uh, the test data this, this time now. I would like instead for this talk to highlight two of the most important metrics. The first being the multiple event statistic, which is shown on the left bottom plot and which relates to the significance of the detected signal. The other uh, important metric is the self-organizing map statistic. This one is derived by applying an unsupervised machine learning clustering algorithm on our data 
foreign clusters based on the transit shape of each candidate. This allows to essentially differentiate between planets for astrophysical false positives and non-astrophysical false positives. The statistic is then derived based on the position of each candidate on the resulting map. It allows to reduce the transit shape into a single metric that is easily incorporated into our machine learning models. And finally, we have that the statistical validation itself. For this process, the machine learning classification is calibrated and transformed into probability, with the only ex exception being the Gaussian process classifier, which is naturally probabilistic. The probability from the machine learning classification is then combined with the pre-computed pair probabilities we've shown before. And this allows us to calculate the posterior probability for each scenario. Then candidates with probability higher than 99% to be planets can be validated. Since we're using four different machine learning classifiers, we are essentially introducing an independent check within the pipeline, as we require each candidate to be validated by all four methods. And thus there is no reliance on a single one. This also effectively reduces the uh, bias introduced by any overfitting from each of the four models, since we're using four independent methods. And I would like to conclude with essentially the science outcomes expected from our pipeline. First of all, of course, is the validation of many test candidates, which will be potentially inaccessible to independent confirmation, but with strong evidence from their transit signal to be true planets. This will allow for such uh, candidates to be used in population studies, such as the study of the Neptunian desert, which is a subject that I'm particularly interested in. It also allows for the potential real-time ranking of candidates, essentially giving a score on which candidate is more, li more likely to be a planet, which should be very helpful in arranging follow-up observations and prioritization. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and I'm ready to take any question. Thanks very much, Andres. Um, I don't see any questions coming through the Slack at the moment. So if anyone wants to type one, feel free. Oh, I see someone typing, <laughs> give it a second. Um, so Christina Hedges has asked, are you thinking of using things like the Gaia um, Rue to inform your model? How's the Rue, if I might ask? Um, it's the, if I remember right, does someone want to clarify? I think it's the residuals from the Gaia model, so evidence for sort of significant astrometric movement of the target. Well, I mean, the answer is essentially not at the moment. We are, at the moment, we're looking of, uh, in, essentially training our models based on the metrics we're using. And we will assess the performance later on. And if something like the Gairo can improve our results, then yes, we can uh, then enhance our model essentially using additional information. Great, thanks very much. Um, unless there's any more questions coming through, please check the Slack afterwards and we'll move on to the next speaker. So thanks again, Andreas. Sure, thank you very much. Um, and next we have Dan Moldovan. Hello everyone, uh, so let me just quickly share screen. Can everyone screen, uh, see my screen? Yes, great. Great. So hello everyone, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dan Moldovan and I'm a software engineer at Google. And today I will talk about um, the work that we've done on improving the astronaut neural network used uh, for the test mission. For a bit of uh, background, Astronet is part of the Quick Look pipeline, which is used by the mission to process the raw full frame uh, imagery collected from the satellite and identify promising transit signals to be uh, more closely analyzed by uh, experts using our follow up observations, for instance. Within the QLP, the role of Astronet is to classify phase folded light curves. The phase folding is based on periodicity information computed by an upstream module. It's called uh, BLS, and it's named after the block um, least square search algorithm that it, uh, that it uses. Now, at its core, Astronaut itself is a convolutional neural network. As you probably know, convolutional neural networks are effective at uh, image processing and classification tasks. And we can use such um, image uh, processing tasks here 
because we can think of a light curve as simply a one dimensional image, that is a line of pixels, as we can see in the example here at the middle, which is just a one by n image stretched out vertically a little bit so that it uh, stands out more clearly. Now, a lot can be said about neural networks, and it's not within the scope of this presentation to introduce them, but let me just quickly summarize a few important key points. First, one can think about deep learning as just a fancier least squares uh, model, one that scales better with, um, with the increased number of examples and also handles better the nonlinearity of the problem. Now, neural networks have been found empirically to work well, but it's not yet clearly understood why they work so well. Theoretically, neural networks are just function, universal function approximators which means they should be able, at least in theory, to learn any kind of function. And that could easily include any spurious details if you're not careful with, the, with your data set. Now, from a practical perspective, neural networks are best viewed as black boxes. It's not very practical to conclude much by looking at, for instance, neural weights or their, acti or their activations. And empirical methods are typically more practical for tasks like debugging, testing and validation. Next, let me present some of the progress that uh, we made on this um, ongoing effort. First, as I just alluded in a previous slide, the quality of the training data is very important for neural networks. In general, machine learning is a classical example of the garbage in, garbage out idea, but neural networks are particularly sensitive these uh, universal function approximators will happily learn any faults in your data if, if you're not careful. So to that end, we've created a new high quality data set. It totals around 20,000 examples. They have been curated from the primary test mission uh, using bright star information. Uh, they are sampled from both the Northern and Southern hemispheres. And the sampling has been, has gen was generally um, uniform with one exception, we excluded those signals for which the period, uh, period calculation would result that the planet or the star would fall within the, uh, the, the center star, star itself. Uh, we've broken this data set into a standard uh, machine learning split with a separate training, validation, and testing subsets. And in, over the next, uh, in a few minutes, I will describe the labels that we assigned to each of these 20,000 examples. Each of uh, such examples was, were, was uh, each such example was labeled by human raters, and the human raters use the report that looks like this. The example that we see here is an instance of the first label that we have, E, representing planets or non-contact eclipsing binaries. Another label that we have is S, which is like E but is reserved for light curves that only contain a single transit. So in these instances, it's impossible to tell whether the LS identified the correct period or not. And we are less confident that the transit is not just a spurious dip. We also use the S label for instances where BLS detected an incorrect period. Here, for instance, if we squint a little bit, we can see that the period detected by DLS is about three times shorter, shorter than what it should be based on the light curve. Another label that we have is B to distinguish contact binary stars, which are quite frequent as we've seen and have this uh, distinctive and rec recognizable shape. There is of course, of course the uh, J label standing for junk, which uh, captures signals that are less interesting for our purpose such as stereo, stellar variability, instrumental noise, and other uh, kinds of artifacts. And lastly, there is the label N for undecided example, where the signal was too difficult to classify, at least by human, often because it would be um, too faint in the noise. Now, one of the things which makes this data set of particularly good quality is that we used independent, multiple, uh, multiple independent raters for each examples. And uh, for those examples where the raters did not assign a unanimous label, we combined the votes in one of two ways. 
if at least one of the raters used the E or the S labels, label, then we reviewed the example in a group session where we had a closer look, we discussed and decided on the final label that should be assigned. Otherwise, if it's just a disagreement between, for instance, an ecliptic binary or junk, we just assign a partial, partial multiple labels, which is something that our training process affords us to do. Now, what this means is that we have a very high confidence that examples which are labeled E or S are indeed eclipses, and conversely, the examples which are not labeled E or S are not. Next, we use this data set to train a new model. The model itself is an improvement over the existing AstroNet architecture, uh, which we tweaked slightly. We, for instance, reduced the number of layers and added a few extra input features. Primarily, the input features are either slices of the face folded light curve. They are typically focused on particular areas of interest, or they can also be light curves folded with different parameters. In both cases, we call these uh, features, we call them views. The original astronaut model had, first it had two views and then a subsequent development had three views. One of them was the global view, which is the entire face folded light curve. Then there is another view, the, the primary eclipse view, which is a zoom in over the primary eclipse. Um, and then the optional third view was a view over the secondary eclipse. We've added a few more such uh, views. For instance, we added um, a view that represents a phase folding at half and respectively at double the DLS period. And we also included uh, views, for instance, that contained individual transits sampled from the light curve. And we've also added a few extra features from the stellar parameters that we had available, such as uh, the stellar uh, mass and the stellar radius. And we also included things like the number of points found in the light curve and the number of folds that, um, that the uh, face folded light curve contained. All in all, we did this with the aim to make sure that the model received as input the same kind of information that human raters had as much as possible. Then, uh, just like the original astronaut model, the entire model was trained separately 10 times and the final output can take, combines the predictions from these 10 models. This is a process known as ensembling, and it's known to help improve the robustness of the model, especially for the, those more harder and more complicated inputs. Finally, um, we have some initial performance results on the new model compared to the previous version of the astronaut that we had in production. The model was, uh, which was developed by um, uh, Yu Liang. Uh, but as a quick aside, if you're not familiar with the precision and the recall metrics that we use, let me just quickly uh, refresh them. Um, precision, which you might recognize as reliability, is just, it just gives us an indication of how many uh, um, false positives is the model generated to, uh, expected to generate. Whereas recall, which you might recognize as completeness, just gives us a hint of how many of the actual eclipses out there was the model able to recover? And as another quick uh, aside, let me just remind that the, our model produces predictions as a score between zero and one for the E label. And if we apply a threshold to that score, we can generate a binary classification. And that allows us to adjust the trade-off between precision and the recall to some extent. Uh, in our tests, we found that a low threshold of 0 0.03 gives us, gave us 100% recall, that is, the model was able to identify all E examples at around 60% precision in our validation split of the data set. We also tested the model on uh, data from the extended mission. And let me just remind that the training data set only contains data from the primary mission. And um, on the extended mission, on this extended mission test, we obtained uh, around 90, 97, 98% recall at around the same precision as the validation result. Lastly, we tested the model on the TOI catalog and the model there was able to identify 99% of the entries for a total of 19 false negatives. Um, now, if we increase the threshold a little bit, we get better precision, which means fewer false positives um, to be uh, for, for, for manual review. 
but the recall drops slightly as well. So there is a compromise. Still, the model compares, compares favorably with the one, the one that's currently in production. Now, one satisfying thing to see was that from among those 19 false negatives uh, from the TOI catalog, six of them turned out to actually be indeed negative signals. And we followed up with the TOI team and had them removed from the catalog. These are uh, it's encouraging results, we hope. Um, but our work continues. First, um, we would like to release this data set to publish to the, to the community so that other model uh, developers could use it to learn their own, uh, to, to train their own models. Uh, we'd also like to publish these, uh, these results. We would also like to develop a new data set and model that can actually distinguish between eclipsing binaries and planets, which is something that the current model doesn't do. And there are also a few interesting directions for future development. For instance, we didn't do any data augmentation at all, although we know that is expected to notably improve performance. Other interesting ideas include continuous learning, where we take data from the follow-up follow -up observations and put it back into a, a data set to gradually grow it. Um, there, there are also plenty of directions for improving the architecture and the training process of the model. Asimut is still um, a fairly basic model compared to the state of the art in, in other applications. And of course, there is uh, the prospect of an end-to-end -end architecture, for instance, a model that could take raw full-frame imagery and produce uh, planet candidate predictions directly. With that, I would like to thank you and open up for questions. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, nice talk. I had one myself. If anyone wants to type anything in the Slack, I can fill in for a gap there. But what sort of processing time do you get to run the test data set on with this? Is it in the context of the FFIs and the extended mission? Is it a big job or relatively quick? Uh, that's a good question. So I don't have uh, precise information for the pre-processing steps uh, for processing the FFI and applying the BLS. Um, the training time of Astronet itself, once we have the face folded light curves, is within the uh, order of hours. It's been increasing gradually as we add in more, uh, more features. Uh, in general, to retrain a pipeline from end to end, probably I would estimate it as no, as no more than maybe one or two days of processing mm -hmm. time on a single machine. For predictions, it's much faster. Uh, the extended mission test, which contained uh, at least a few hundred uh, examples, prediction is finished within the order of minutes, tens of minutes at most. Great. Thanks very much. Um, if there aren't any other questions, then we can move on to the next speaker. So thanks again, Dan. Thank you. And the next one is Claudia Reyes. OK, thank you. Um, okay. I can see that. Okay. Great. Um, I will. Uh, my name is Claudia Reyes. I'm a PhD student from UNSW, and I will be talking about uh, how we are using machine learning to obtain reliable frequency separations. And in particularly, I will be mentioning two frequencies, which are nu max and delta nu. Um, they are interesting to us because we can use them to calculate masses and radii very easily and with high precision. Um, we can get nu max and delta nu from the power spectra of red giants and other solar-like oscillators, where there will be a power excess with this general shape. Um, the central frequency of this bell is called New max. And looking closer into this part, this part of the spectrum, um, we can see that there are different oscillation models. Um, the number on top of each peak indicates the degree number of each mode. Um, there is some pattern to these modes. Uh, in this example, the pattern starts again after about eight microhertz. This distance is called delta nu, and sometimes it can be hard to measure, but 
when you have it, um, you can use it together with Numax uh, to calculate the mass and the radius of the stars like this. So the good news is that we have large amounts of data from space telescopes and we are expecting much more from tests. We also have uh, different pipelines that extract Numax and Delta Nu automatically. Um, the, this distribution in the center corresponds to the best Delta Nu sample that we have to date, and it's from Kepler. And we plot it like this because um, Numax scales with luminosity, and this fraction here uh, scales with mass. And all values that make that make up each point here uh, were calculated automatically by one of the pipelines. But the problem is that automatic results from those pipelines are not always reliable, um, which is why this sample had to be manually vetted by an expert. Um, on the right here, uh, we see how the real results look when they are given by the different pipelines. And while these are delta nu calculated from much shorter time series. Uh, the distributions should still look much cleaner. Um, each one of these five pipelines is using different techniques to make cuts on the results, trying to deliver a sample with only the good values, but they're doing it blindly. And it doesn't work because we can see the cuts that look artificial. And compared with this distribution on the left, we see many outliers. Um, that is because too many delta nu are wrong. So this confidence problem is what we try to solve with machine learning. And it's why we created a classifier that analyzes each spectrum to decide if the delta nu is correct. And at the end of my talk, I will show you how these samples look after applying our classifier. Um, I'm going to use the spectrum of this star to exemplify how we validate delta nu values when we do it manually. And the reason why it's easy to make mistakes when trying to measure delta nu is because you don't know what degree number corresponds to each peak in the spectrum. So to help make sense of this, and since we are looking for a repeating pattern, uh, we look at the autocorrelation function. And the red lines indicate where the autocorrelation peaks are expected. And in this case, the peaks are where they should be if the delta nu value is correct. Um, and there's another tool that is also helpful um, to do this, and it's the HL diagram. And it works like this. Uh, you take segments of width uh, one delta nu, and you stack them like this. And then uh, you can represent the amplitudes of the peaks as color intensity in the resulting array on the right. And if the width of the segment is right, you should see the modes aligning vertically. So we do this, uh, we take the tail diagram of this star and we can see that the modes align very nicely. So they are easy to identify. Um, there is also the folded spectrum, uh, which is a collapsed form of the HL diagram. And if we overlay a template that we created from models of oscillations, we see again that they match. So we can confirm that this delta nu value was reliable. Um, this second example is a typical case where there is periodicity in the spectrum, but even when there is a peak here at one delta nu, uh, in the autocorrelation, it's not clear that the rest of the peaks that we need are there. Are there. And the HL diagram confirms that the modes are not aligning. Uh, and the folded spectrum uh, doesn't really match the template either. So in this case, the delta nu value that was given by the pipeline was wrong. So if you remember the distribution of the best sample that I showed you before, uh, I put on top of it uh, in red and green here, the example of the bad and the good delta nu that I just showed you. 
and they both look like they would belong to this distribution, uh, but we know that the red one shouldn't really be there. Uh, with this, I mean to say that our goal is not to achieve this shape of the distribution, but however, being able to obtain a sample that looks more like this uh, from these samples would be a manifestation that we have improved the reliability of the delta nu measurements. So to obtain a training set, we performed the same visual betting from the examples, but for other 14,000 individual stars. And we found that about half of them were reliable and the rest of them were bad. So having the training set ready, uh, the question became what input features to use for the neural network. So uh, we decided that we will use the HL diagram directly, but to incorporate the other tools that we use in the, in the vetting, we, we designed these three metrics. And the first one is based on the autocorrelation function and the other one and the other two uh, measure similarities between the folded spectrum and the model template. And from evaluating these metrics on the training set, we see that even individually, they can help separate the good delta news from the bad delta news. So we fit these three metrics plus one categorical feature that is just new max encoded. Um, we fit it to branch A of the network. And since the ETL diagram can be treated as an image, uh, we use a convolutional branch for it. And the output of this network is a probability between zero and one, where one means high confidence that the delta nu is good. So after running the classifier on the entire training set, we find uh, that most predictions are very close to zero or very close to one, which is showing confidence in the prediction. Uh, the central panel uh, shows only the mistakes of the network. And it shows us that most mistakes appear precisely where there is more uncertainty in the prediction. But when the classifier is more certain of its result, it's given very few errors. And the third panel is showing that for a threshold of 0 0.5, we can obtain a precision uh, or purity record or completeness and accuracy, all uh, close to 95.5%. So if we set the threshold a bit higher, uh, eventually we could be able to uh, get a very high purity sample if we had some tolerance for recall. So let's see some real results on data uh, which the neural network ha has not seen. So if we apply our neural network to the samples on the right and color code each point according to the color bar here, we see that the samples uh, start to look more like, like the human vetted sample on the left. And we can also see that the majority of the most evident outliers are removed by giving them a probability very close to zero. So we decided to also test this classifier on this sample from this, even when it has only two months or less of data. And for comparison, we have again the four year sample, but this time we are plotting directly delta nu as a function of nu max. So color coding the test sample according to the results of the classifier, we appear to find the good delta nus exactly where they are expected in this diagram. So these are very encouraging results. And to conclude, while it was a very long process to bet the delta new values from previous space missions uh, with machine learning, it took us only 10 minutes to do the same. So next, uh, we want to apply this new machine learning method to more data from tests so we can provide another good sample much faster than previously done and with many more stars in it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claudia. Very nice talk and lovely results coming out there at the end too. Um, yeah. I don't see any questions on the Slack yet. So um, I had one. What, what sort of numbers of 
stars do you think are going to produce detectable delta nu in tests? Um, we don't have an, a number yet, but uh, we're, most of the RGB stars are supposed to be detectable. Mm -hmm. um, check the Slack later. I don't see any questions coming in right now. <laughs> All right. Even when people will type, but thanks again. And we can move to the next part of the session. So for the remainder of the session, we're going to do a panel discussion um, with several people with the aim that people can ask questions through the Slack, which we'll then put to the panel and try and start off in a bit more of a discussion. And um, the moderator for that's gonna be Megan Anstel. So I'll pass over to Megan now. And thank you, Megan, for moderating. Of course, can you hear me, Ori? Yep. Okay, great. So welcome everybody to the panel discussion portion um, of the Splinter session. So uh, yeah, we'll be taking questions from Slack um, and I'll help to moderate a bit, but I thought we could start off by introducing um, ourselves on the panel. So um, the panelists will be uh, Dan Moldovan, Christina Hedges, Max Winther, Adina Feinstein, um, and myself. So I'll start. Um, my name is Megan Anstel. I'm a program officer uh, at NASA headquarters um, in the Planetary Science Division, and I uh, help run the Exoplanet Research Program, and I also serve on a bunch of cross-divisional uh, working groups related to machine learning and data science. Um, so why don't we go over to Adina. Hi everyone, my name is Adina Feinstein. I'm a fourth year grad student at the University of Chicago. Um, I have developed the convolutional neural network called Stella that Max talked a lot about in his talk today that finds flares in test data. Um, and I'm also interested in applying similar techniques to find exoplanets around young stars. Okay, thanks Adina. Uh, how about Dan? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dan Moldovan. I'm a software engineer at Google where I've been working on um, a variety of machine learning applied, applied machine learning tasks as well as um, developing tools for machine learning. And as a 20% project, I've been helping the, the test uh, team develop the, the astronaut model over the past uh, year or so. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, how about going over to Christina? Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Hedges, and I, uh, up until the mission closed out, was part of the NASA Kepler mission. Uh, I do a lot of data analysis and sort of data work with Kepler tests, K2 data. Uh, and HST, and I mostly care about uh, machine learning in the context of understanding young stars. Okay, thanks, Christina. And finally, Max. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Max Gunter. I'm currently a Taurus Fellow at MIT, working with the test team and transitioning into a role as an ESA Fellow uh, for the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. And I mainly work on any kind of photometric and RV data, really, um, trying to squeeze out anything we can know about exoplanets and flares, stellar flares, um, to merge them and find out about habitability of those little rocky worlds we find around red dwarf stars. Okay, thanks, Max. Um, okay, so I don't think we have any questions on the Slack yet, but we have some questions to start off with. So why don't we start off with a, an easy one? <laughs> Uh, perhaps not. So astronomy presents unusual challenges for machine learning because we rarely know the ground truth exactly. Our data are not evenly spaced or sampled and we have a wide varying data quality based on things like weather at the observatory. What is the most tricky aspect in your opinion and you, do you have any ideas for solutions? Anybody wanna tackle that one? Okay, I can offer I can offer something. Um, I think the I think the most difficult part, um, at least in my own research, has been trying to estimate uncertainties and fold that into um, these machine learning models so that the output of them is something that can be used for science. So, you know, how do we take uncertainties on the measurements in the training set that we have? And how does that translate into, you know, the output of a convolutional neural network in a way that we can actually use them, you know, for science down the line? Um, and that seems to be the most difficult part, um, in my opinion. And you know, people in the machine learning world um, 
do entire PhD theses on, on this right now. So it's a very difficult problem, um, but one that I think would be really helpful um, down the line if we can figure out how to do that, um, at least for some problems. Yeah, I wanted to uh, say something to uh, your first question. Um, you know, it might go a little bit, uh, derail it a little bit, but um, one thing that I kind of became uh, fascinated by or very interested in over the last couple of weeks is now we like created this big test flare catalog using Stella and it does like a fantastic job in picking all these things out. Um, but what we find is that we are often using machine learning in, in our applications, as you pointed out, like, you know, every test sector could be different, like sector 25 has like lots of earth satellites, so it could like look completely different or suddenly we look at a bunch of stars in a young association that are super fast, young variable stars that we didn't have in our training data set. So the a neural network can only predict and, and label what we give it as an input before and what we trained it on. And um, I often find that like we eventually like find more cases and the human eye is really good at picking these out because we had all these world experiences like we've all like looked at test data uh, for countless hours. So we even if we don't know it, like we go to like the neighboring office and ask like, hey, what is this weird star? And it's like, oh, this is like this type of variable or so on. And the, the neural network doesn't have the luxury. Um, so what I'm really interested in is that like we bring in more physics into our machine learning instead of letting it completely like wildly go off on like, you know, here are cats and dogs distinguish between them, but like it sees a horse and it doesn't know what to do. Um, it doesn't have the like privilege that we as humans have that we can ask our neighbor about what is a horse. Um, and like there's like techniques and, and I'm sure and, the other panelists know more than me about it or like then especially um, as a software engineer um, and like a uh, human in the loop uh, for example um, is a nice common technique that we haven't really or at least i don't know about it that we have really applied it in in our field yet um, where basically we give it a training data set like for our stellar catalog um, for example we give it the the flares uh, on those stars that we've known before we let it predict things and in certain cases where it's super certain, like this looks exactly like a training data set, um, it predicts it with high confidence, like nobody needs to look at it anymore, like it's for sure a flare. But sometimes it comes out with like, I'm not sure, like this star looks weird. And that would like go to a human uh, vetter and the human vetter would like look at it and in an automated process loop, the human vetter would say, hey, this isn't a flare, this is just a really fast rotating star and like all the peaks of the sine wave get like picked out of flares and like, this is wrong. Uh, that's a false positive or this is a new category and you feed this back into the training data sample immediately um, so basically you help the machine learning algorithm learn with your human input along the way which takes a bit of like the the privilege away of like we just sit back we let like you know the machine learning run for a week and it's done um, but it makes the whole like training process much better it's kind of like you know teaching a, a, a kindergarten kid or a school kid like along the way holding the hand and like increasing the training data sample. And I think that's something that the field needs to look into. Uh, for a bit of follow up on that very idea, which I, I fully agree with. Um, from my observations, um, the, the, one of the major challenges we see is one of seeding, um, so to speak. Um, although, for instance, uh, research on Kepler gave us a head start but what I'm talking about is the existing of a large enough, especially for deep learning, which is uh, requires lots and lots of data. Well, it works best with lots and lots of data when you put it this way. But um, it is uh, the, the most challenging task, or at least the most time consuming task is preparing a large enough data set that we can, uh, that we can work with. And the idea of gradually growing and gathering all the knowledge that is being created especially with follow-up observations, which are extremely high quality. That is, from a deep learning practitioner's perspective, that is gold. It's very high quality data. It's excellent to, to put into the training process. So um, to, 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 make a, to make a comparison, for instance, with uh, machine translation, where we just took the internet, right? You have thousands of pages of data that is already translated and you have a, ma a massive, relatively good quality data set that you can train your models in. In astronomy, we are forced to start with very little. And I expect it will take a little bit of time for us to, to curate and grow data sets that are large enough to be able to, to train 
uh, extremely competent models. Yeah, and I feel like this, this touches on another um, difficulty that we run into in, in astronomy is creating these training sets. And, you know, you can have, so for example, with Stella, we trained on Max's catalog and we're treating it as a catalog of flares, but really it's a catalog of flares that Max has identified, right? And so, you know, we can make probabilities. Um, the output of Stella is, is a probability of a flare, right? But it's a probability of flare that Max has identified, right? And so you have to like think about these things when you apply um, the output of these models um, to, to other aspects um, or to actually like do science with them. And um, Dan, I liked the way that you're you're classifying now or building a training set now with for Astronet where you have you know three people that are looking at everything um, and deciding on a classification from that. And then also I like the um, you can have you know one category or you can have two categories that are weighted a bit too because you know a lot of times with these classifications it's not actually one classification right you can have a bimodal distribution. So I really liked that improvement in Astronet. Okay, let's see, we have a few questions from Slack. Um, okay, so Zoe asked, I was wondering how this discussion extends to synthetic data. How do we know whether generating synthetic data using data-driven methods will actually help in astronomy applications? So that is a very good question. Um, do any of the panelists wanna take a shot at it? Yes, um, part of that question to be somewhat salty. It sounds like, if you have a data-driven way to create synthetic data, you've got a good forward model. And it may be that, um, I guess my comment there is, is just that sometimes when we have a, a good forward model, there are you know techniques that can supplement machine learning that we can use to do some of the science. Um, and if you have a really good forward model for making synthetic data, it may be that machine learning isn't the right approach all of the time in that case. Um, if you can really make good synthetic data, try doing forward modeling. Um, that's a bit of a salty take in the machine learning panel. No, I think that's a very good point. Um, machine learning isn't always the answer. Um, yeah, yeah, and if you have good synthetic data, yeah, you can you can do physics-based machine learning um, models as well. That's one option. Um, but yeah. It, having good enough synthetic data in to train a machine learning model on it where it can't easily distinguish between the synthetic data and the real data. Um, and then having it good enough that you can train on synthetic data and then have it be applied to real data and still perform at the same level is, is difficult. I think the only other thing that I would it, add, sorry. No, 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 go. The only other thing I would add to Zoe's question is that depending on what you want, so uh, if the reason Sometimes we want synthetic data because we want to know, know the answer. Um, the Kepler pipeline did a few things where they came up with data sets where we knew the answer to some level. Like, so we had these um, inverted light curves and we had these scrambled light curves where we knew any answer we found was not real. We had data sets where we scrambled all the time series so that we knew that any transits we found were completely spurious. So another way to approach this is you can make data where you know the answer is there's no valid there's no valid classification inside this data set. And you can use that to try and help validate your machine. And that can be really powerful. Yeah, I really like that point because that, I think that's also the only thing we can really know for sure, <laughs> because it's like a tiny subsection with, with the synthetic data. There's always like so many unknown unknowns. Like, you know, you could create a perfect model of an exoplanet. We have many forward models that are, uh, that work that way, but then, something happens with the spacecraft or especially for like ground-based observatories you know something happens that night like some cloud goes through and everything is thrown off so i think it's hard to like really have synthetic data that mimics an actual like the the addition of all these different layers like the actual exoplanet model is easy but then the actual weather conditions or the actual like spacecraft systematics or scattered light etc um, i think we never can really know that until it actually happened so that's where like forward modeling and like fitting the, the general like fitting with MCMC or nested sampling, I think is a better approach if we actually have one model like this. Uh, 
I definitely agree with the idea. I, I recall uh, one of the training sessions in deep learning that I've attended a few years ago. And one of the slides said something like this. The first thing, that, the first solution that you should attempt um, in, in when, when trying to resolve something with machine learning is not using machine learning in the first place. So if you have a forward model, if you have a good analytical model, have you tried that first? And only then, only if that fails, it's a good idea to move over to, to move on to more black box um, solutions and the like. And to add on to that, when you do try machine learning, don't automatically go to something like deep learning. Start with a very simple machine learning model and see if that works first. Yeah, I'm always per, uh, mesmerized by like how well a simple random forest just works for almost all cases. Like it, it's really intuitive as well. With, with regards to synthetic data, one challenge that we've seen, at least um, for Astronet, was um, there is always a bit of uncertainty about whether our generated synthetic data is realistic. Um, how do we prevent, how do we make sure we don't generate synthetic data that we are sure, for instance, we try to generate noise. How do we make sure that we don't accidentally generate a transit? thinking it's noise. And yeah, we ran into, go ahead, sorry. sorry. No, I was gonna say we ran into similar problems with um, Stella at first where we tried to use synthetic flares to train on, but there are just so many different shapes and different peaks that we just couldn't capture all of that in one uh, good training set. And so that's why we ended up using Max's flare catalog. But, you know, I agree if, if we knew the best like flare model and all the different morphologies and, and how they interact with each other it would have been the, the right way to do it. Yeah, and the, the Kepler um, sort of test data sets, we had the inverted one as well, which was just like kind of slipped upside down. And the nice thing about that is it's got all of the systematics, but there aren't, there shouldn't be any flares that can be inverted uh, other than I suppose exocomet. And so um, you can make, the, you can you can have these edge cases like Max was saying to where you know there's nothing, but it's very difficult to make it to do anything, anything in between. Okay, we have a question um, on Stella, which Adina might be able to take. So this is from um, Ballant. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that name. Um, Hi everyone. Is there a straightforward way to use the available deep learning tools, e.g. Stella, for the different test cadences without fully retraining them? With the upcoming FFI data, there will be two minute, 10 minute, 30 minute, and 200 second cadences. And as far as I know, most tools work on the two minute data. Yeah, so I think with Stella, you can probably just straight apply it to the two minute FFIs, but we're not doing anything for the 10 or 30 minute just because the sampling also, I don't think is good enough to really capture full flare um, energies and uh, statistics that way. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about, especially with respect to Max's project, now that he has this years one and two is, can we transfer what we've learned from Stella from sectors one and two to all of the systematics that we're now seeing in the full year? And so I think that there is a lot of play and area where you can take what's already been trained and then apply it to all this new catalog um, with all these new systematics, then move forward from there. Um, but in terms of on our end, fully retraining them, I don't think that that is in the, the cards right now. Okay, um, Rodrigo asks a question for panelists. How do you think we should be preparing for Ruben and Roman with respect to exoplanets? I have I have thoughts. No one's gonna add any thoughts. Okay, so some some uh, opinions, unqualified opinions. Um, uh, I think there's lots of information buried in, particularly for Roman. There's going to be information that's buried in the image data, and what we tend to have to do to do detection or to do validation, 
with machine learning, we tend to have to take the data set and do not only some whitening, which is absolutely necessary, but do some sort of binning or some sort of um, summing where we, for example, sum up over the pixel values, we whiten out um, the bulk uh, flux of the target. And that is at some level getting rid of some of the information that we have in this image data. And I think to be really prepared for next generation telescopes, we're potentially going to have to develop algorithms that run on whitened image data rather than whitened summed image data um, to really capture all of that information. That's, uh, that's the way I think we're gonna to need to go. But I'd love to hear from the other panel. Yeah, I love the idea. That's something like I've always been wondering about for tests and, and maybe Dan and Adina can uh, chip in on that. Um, obviously like we have the light curve, so it's, it, it's more straightforward and easier to like run it on the light curves. But I wonder like how much more we can get out of it if we actually look at the, at the raw or like even like slightly like detrended um, image data of it, um, especially many things for, for example, for um, exonet and astronet, et cetera, for like exoplanet detection verification. You know, uh, we found out for like over the couple of years and iteration of papers that we as in like uh, Andrew and Chris and others, uh, Zoe as well, and um, that, you know, you need to include like a second time series or third time series because you need the centroiding time series. Otherwise you're going to be swarmed by uh, nearby eclipse and binaries that are blended in the aperture. And these kind of things would probably be very intuitive for the network to learn uh, if you actually like train it on the image data. Um, and likewise, possibly like with flares um, for, for Stella, um, blended flares, for example, right now, like there's two light curves that are treated independently, maybe both pop up like flares. Uh, if it's a close uh, uh, star system or even a, a resolved binary system. But um, looking at the image data will probably be very easy for the algorithm to pick down. Like, oh yeah, the flare goes off like on this pixel and not on this pixel here. Um, so yeah, Dan and Adina, I'm, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. Like how much more work will it be <laughs> to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think based on what the community has been doing right now, like we can use the test FFIs, the 20, the two minute, the 10 minute, the 200 second to start playing around with this idea. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we'll go about like defining ourselves, which pixels get which labels are in which categories, things like that. But, you know, I think that that is a worthy undertaking. And I think when it comes to this kind of data, you want to use it in as raw of a like, pro like, uh, in as raw of a form as possible. And so if we can backtrack and get rid of apertures, get rid of detrending, get rid of all this stuff, I think that that is a, a great way forward. Definitely agree. Um, it's kind of the, the holy grail of, of machine learning to build an end-to-end -end model from, from raw FFI to prediction. And um, I believe it's definitely not a trivial, um, trivial task bordering on research is uh, definitely a, develop, uh, a non-trivial development task. It probably has um, some research components. That said, in the state of the art of image processing, there are applications for example, for example, object localization, image segmentation, and things like that. So th those are all concepts that we should be able to apply for FFIs. Yeah, I think we, we have this really awesome data, particularly when you look at tests, we have these awesome data sets of like small five by five image jets. And, and that's a very like machine learnable size of, of images, the, the sort of like five by five cutout of a, of a PSF. Um, and I think we, if we were able to invest, if, if we the community were able to invest some time in taking the sort of TPF data that we have and turning it into like a whitened training set, um, with some parameters that we could all agree on where like this is a reasonable way to whiten this data. I think we could do some uh, awesome testing to get ready for doing this kind of like image based machine learning for, for the future for instruments like Roma. I think uh, just to, to add to this, another example that just popped into my mind is for like the flare search. Um, in, in my original like uh, sector one and two catalog where I used more like just simple detrending and then outlier detection to get flares. We had tons and tons and hundreds of asteroids that go through because they cause the similar bumps on a similar time scale as flares. The only difference being their shape. So by eye, 
as like after seeing the first one and looking at the pixel data it's like oh there's something moving through and then when i see it in the light curves i'm immediately recognized because i trained my eyes my human eyes uh, and like kicked all these out so i think like in stella i haven't seen any of these because they weren't in the training sample um because like we cleaned up the training sample accordingly um so it does a good job like it, it knows like the shape to distinguish it but in the pixel level view, it would like immediately know this is something different. This is not one pixel getting brighter and fainter. This is actually like something moving through the entire array of pixels that you give it. So it's very, very different. And that's similar to like the nearby eclipse in binaries, et cetera, and the blending issues that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, yeah, so that I think there's like many applications where it can learn, but there's also a big caveat um, to like what we discussed so far, I think like we also have, as humans, we have to retrain ourselves to look at the images. Because I think like most of us are used to looking at light curves. So it's very easy to you know, pick out flares and exoplanets in a light curve, even if there's a lot of noise. But if somebody gives us like the two minute cadence or even like the 20 second cadence where we give even lower SNR um, images of like an exoplanet transit of like a few parts per thousand, um, I don't think any of us could by eye see that this is actually an exoplanet transit because like the, the scales are just too similar. So we used to looking at the light curve representation. That's what we trained for years. We used to seeing at things spinned so that we actually like see, oh, there's like one big black point like lying down here. So this is like a transit. Uh, we're used to looking at the face folded things just to increase the SNR for our eyes. And I think that's going to be the biggest problem potentially to like creating that data set and the training data set and actually like verifying that whatever the machine learning algorithm picks out is actually an exoplanet transit or a flare or an asteroid or something like that. Yeah, I think that's something that would be really cool that might not be super uh, like computationally accessible by most people would be if you were able to feed the entire full frame image into some machine learning algorithm and then you can actually trace solar system bodies across the image. Um, I think that would be a way cooler well i guess all science is cool and different imaging and stacking is also cool but if you can actually trace it across the ffi like immediately that would be a sweet thing to do for for people interested in solar system bodies um so i will say that um my group are actually working on solar system bodies and tests and this is something that we that we care a lot about we're not using machine learning for it we're using uh, forward modeling for it and that's working um pretty well um, but I think uh, Max here is a really good point about the solar system objects, particularly for TESS. Um, we also have a label training set of that because we know where the bright objects are in, in the solar system. And so we can predict this cadence has a, a bright object moving through it. So it's a, it's a really good point. Um, I was going to tell you guys something about the the FFI image. Oh, one thing that one thing to say, uh, Max, about because you, you're exactly right. You know, the the image data it's hard to pick apart, but we do have this really. We have an, an interesting subset of this data where we have Kepler at high uh, spatial precision, higher spatial resolution than TESS, and so for example, for blends, we know from Kepler which targets in TESS are going to be like blended binaries potentially because Kepler has shown us where the binaries are for some subset and so it'd be interesting to use Kepler maybe to make a sort of labeled data set where we know okay this should be a blend let's see what the machine says um, that could be kind of interesting yeah I completely agree like the more information we can get from other sources in there the the better the the one caveat with all that is that we have to be careful to not fall into the trap of biasing our training sample, right? Like say 10 years ago, we would have trained it only on known exoplanets and we would only find nowadays hot Jupiters. We would miss all the Earth-like planets or high eccentricity planets and things like that, disintegrating planets, all the interesting stuff we would miss. So it's even like if we, now we have a better set, but we have to like de-bias it for the detection biases that went into it. Also like if we look at only fields where Kepler and TESS overlapped or K2 and TESS, um with like the the next coming year for observations um we also have to be careful that like the stellar populations are are the same and representative yeah i agree i think um maybe i i don't mean to make us linger on this question but to, to add on to like what do we need to see in the future and building off of what max said um there finding the sort of serendipitous objects, the, the tabby stars, the, the disintegrating planets, the, the things that don't 
occur very frequently. Um, machine learning can help us do that by, you know, with a lot of the sort of time series prediction methods. Um, and I'd really love to see that be a direction that we go in as a community before we reach sort of Roman levels because finding those serendipitous objects is gonna be really hard work for the community if we're all gonna to have to be looking through lots of light curves. And so having that support from machine learning algorithms saying that this doesn't cluster anywhere near anything that I know about, um, I can't predict this, that's gonna be really helpful, I think, in the future. Yeah, one last, I love that point. And that, that like leads me back to the human in the loop thing. Like if the machine learning is like set up this way that like, everything it's like easy to classify like a hot jupiter or like stellar noise or variability like so, um, like it, it just directly classifies and uh, but everything else is like i don't know like what is tabby star like I, I don't know what that is you know i don't know like what this weird disintegrating planet thing is so it just like gives a big question mark and puts it to the the, the human better team behind it and then like the human vetters are like oh this is interesting or like oh why did you fail in your network like this is actually a very simple variable star I think that that can be a nice bridge. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. So um, Akash asks, uh, how would we get better at reducing false negatives while using machine learning? For example, while using Stella to find flares, it's easy to go back and vet false positives by eye but it's much harder to figure out in the if the algorithm missed any flares without actually looking at every light curve. Um, I mean, I guess I can give, I'll give this an initial shot. Um, I think one thing that Dan showed in his presentation is that you can tweak um, the threshold that you have for um, identifying something as a flare or not a flare or an exoplanet or not an exoplanet. And you can tweak that so that your you know, your precision or accuracy might, your precision might be pretty low, but um, your recall, so the number of uh, true examples that you get correct can be 100%. So that's one thing that you can do is just sort of tune that threshold parameter so that you might have to vet a lot of um, examples, but you will recall um, all of them. Do any of the other panelists have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, definitely um, tuning your model to, to, to produce uh, conservative predictions so that you miss as few uh, true examples as possible is definitely, actually, I think it's one of the few viable strategies at, at the moment. It is important to mention, I believe, especially for, uh, for um, the non-deterministic methods like deep learning, it is to be expected that you will have uh, one or two examples that will be just very difficult and the model will miss them. Um, in general, you should expect your model to be 99% accurate and gaining that extra 1% is usually difficult. So you, you need to be prepared for it. Um, one way to, to deal with it is for deep learning to throw more data at the problem. For instance, you have a, a, a difficult example to classify. That is usually typically because those examples are rare. You only have say, I don't know, five or 10 in your data set and the model just doesn't see enough to train. And in that case, finding more examples like the difficult one and uh, giving it to the model is uh, a potential way to, to improve the predictions. But in general, um, probably the, uh, the, the most full, the, the most reliable method to make sure that you don't miss um, such valuable examples is to take a random sample from your data set and carefully, um, carefully analyze each example. That's, that's practically the only way. Basically, don't, don't rely on the machine to, to select the good examples for you. Do a random sample and identify the good ones. Okay, I think we are out of time. Um, so I will hand it back to David at this point. Great, thanks Megan, and thanks to the whole panel. That was really interesting. So I have a couple of announcements before we finish up. Um, firstly, there are some more questions that people put onto the Slack as we were finishing up. So feel free to just carry on the discussion there, anyone that's interested. Um, 
I have to remind everyone there's a Juno mission talk in quarter of an hour in room one, for anyone interested in that. Um, and lastly, thanks to all our speakers, panelists and co-organizers for putting together such an interesting session. So thanks again. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs>